are types of software and software development life cycle before we move ahead to types of software uh, i believe we did what software was so just a quick recap of what a software is before we dive into types so it's just simple set of instructions i would say set of instructions provided to computer or some electronic device and what it does it tells the computer device how to perform and what specific task needs to be done what specific task is being uh, asked by the software so this was the basic definition what a software is we also covered characteristics of a good software and we also covered the application part how application is different from a software and three major applications uh, types of a mobile app that is your native hybrid and web app so today we would be dealing with types of software in details we would be covering the types of software the earlier part that we covered the app uh, the application part we understood that every application is a part of software but every software is not an application so if we have to write it in a hierarchical form then if this is an app then there are some other parts inside the box and this is your software so every app is a software but every software is not an app there are certain different aspects other than app as well so we would be studying those aspects as well today in detail so let's move ahead and study different types of software so while working on a computer we come across various computer softwares which help us to ease our tasks and increase the overall efficiency of the work progress anything from creating a simple document if you create a simple document or you surf on the internet on a computer system it is done using the software that's why it's, it holds so much importance creating a document surfing on internet it's only because of software so let's discuss how many types of software it can be divided into broadly this uh, the software can be divided into two major types what are those two types first is the system software second is the application software so we would be going through them one by one let's understand what a system software is so if we think of software as different layers so how would i define it suppose we have a stack and in this we have three different layers this particular layer would point to your hardware this particular layer is your system software and this particular layer is your application software so just remember this if this is your hardware above that lies your soft, uh, system software and above that lies your application software so we can think software as different layers and within those layers system software is lying between the hardware and the application software so system software is the bottom layer of your software stack so let's see a beautiful image depicting this particular thing that we just understood so just just look over here this is your hardware above hardware lies your system software and above system software is your application software so we would be understanding how they are interacting as well so moving on to system software there are various categories under system software as well so points to remember over here are system software communicate between the hardware and the computer application so it's the middle part between the hardware and uh, application is your system software system softwares act as platforms they are platforms for other softwares to run on your computers so suppose you have a web browser and if web browser wants to run on your computer on your uh, this is your computer as well different uh, hardware parts then system software allows the browser to run on the hardware so we'll see how it runs for example uh, operating system operating system is a part of system software so uh, you, for instance you have operating system like windows or your mac operating system or it may be android or ios any any operating system now operating systems are loaded inside ram the random access memory operating systems are loaded inside ram whenever the device starts up and then they have access to hard drives so 
just uh, understand that uh, the flow, the operating systems cannot exist all by themselves. First, when you switch on your computer, it is loaded into RAM. And then it has access to all the hard drives, your C drive, D drive, and so on. And you can access material over here. And within those drives, you have downloaded one of the application softwares, which runs. Now let's understand how these uh, system softwares work in different categories. So there are different types of system software. Let's understand them with the help of examples. So I've divided into five major categories. First is your operating system. Let's cover this one first. Very briefly, we'll cover all the system softwares and the application softwares as well. So what is an operating system? We, are, we all are familiar with it. So operating system is the primary computer system, I would say, that allows your devices to function. So operating system allows your device to boot up. So major function is it allows your device to boot up. What is boot up? It's like just like when you switch on your computer, that process is called booting up when you restart your computer. Second function of our operating system is it includes all the protocols, all the rules that are used for installing and operating other applications on the device. For instance, your Windows comes with certain protocols pre-decided, which helps other softwares like your drivers and firmwares to run on these windows. So operating system helps the device to boot up. It contains the rules predefined for other applications. So this is the major benefit of operating system. Different operating systems run on different types of hardware and are designed for different types of applications. So uh, what I mean by this is these are sometimes device specific. Device or company specific. For instance, your Mac OS can run on Apple uh, PCs. Your iOS can run on Apple phones. Your Android runs on uh, the other phones, the Android phones. Windows run on your Windows PC or Windows laptop. So that's how sometimes operating systems are device specific. Companies have bought the right for their operating systems to be launched on their respective devices, smartphones or PCs and other electronic devices as well. But there is flexibility. If you wish to install another operating system, in some cases, you can install it. If company provides the flexibility that you can install Mac OS on your systems, you can do it. If you want to install Windows on a Mac uh, or, or Windows on your Apple computers, if flexibility is provided by the company, you can do it. So one of the system softwares that we need to remember is operating system. Major function helps to boot up the device contains the rules for other applications and other operate other uh, uh, softwares to run and they are device sp uh, specific second comes your device drivers what do we mean by device driver so device driver is a particular form of software that allows one hardware device to interact with another hardware device for instance uh, let's uh, understand by this this is h1 I would say, and this is H2. So one hardware device needs to interact with another hardware device that helps with your device drivers. Suppose this is your computer and this is your printer. Now, if they both want to connect to each other, there must be some drivers installed into your computer. Those drivers are of your printer. Printer drivers needs, needs to be installed in your computer then only your computer can access the functionality of a printer. So these are also called software drivers, which usually come with the peripheral device. These uh, drivers usually come with the, uh, the device that you're connecting to your machine. It could be your scanner, it could be your keyboard, it could be a modem. Any device that, uh, that you connect with your system and you want to access the functionality, you usually, we usually used to get driver CDs. If you remember earlier, we used to get driver CDs with the devices. For instance, if we are buying a keyboard, we need to install the driver CD. If we are buying a printer, we need to install the driver CD inside our system. But now because everything is online, companies are providing those drivers online. You can visit their websites, register your product, and you can download the respected driver. So what happens as soon as we install the driver's software into a computer, 
it detects our computer detects and identifies the peripheral device that we have connected and we are now able to control the device with the computer so uh, are we are we able to understand how they are getting connected this computer first gets the hardware the device hardware the device driver and then it it uh, identifies that some new device has been connected suppose uh, you must have seen when you connect a usb on to your uh, on to your laptop your laptop gives a pop up that a new device has been connected a new device has been recognized that is because usb drivers are pre installed in your pcs in in your laptops so if we uh, sum up the information that we have just learned a device driver is a piece of software that allows your computer's operating system to communicate with peripheral devices like printers scanners speakers keyboards anything so now things are getting connected your operating system is in your computer your computer is simple hardware but what is recognizing this device driver that is your operating system so device driver is a software that is recognized by the operating system on your computer and then through this operating system our computer is now able to communicate with this particular device that is being connected so just a simple driver simple software that comes along with additional peripheral device and our operating system is able to identify that device once we install those drivers into our system simple so it comes with additional devices third is your firmware firmware is a type of software that operates a hardware device by telling it how to perform now for very simple example is if we take a printer now there are certain firmwares that are that are inside your printer and this firmware tells your printer okay what kind of command means what what print means for for uh, for this device what does copy means so these firmwares are those set of instructions those set of uh, uh, i would say rules that are pre embedded into your uh, peripheral devices and then they tell the peripheral device what particular command means what they tell the device what needs to be performed and how it needs to be performed so they usually uh, come they usually come with the peripheral devices as a uh, these device drivers are need to be installed inside your computer for operating system to be uh, to recognize it but firmware comes with your extra devices that you're connecting it could be your speaker it could be your monitors it could be your routers so hard drives all these devices have pre installed firmwares in them which knows what kind of instruction means what so so like these are your bios firmwares what is bios basic input output system so any input output device that you are connected input like your keyboard mouse anything output device any additional screen you are connecting any speaker you are connecting those are output devices so they have firmware pre installed next comes your language translators these are very important for a web developer or a full stack developer because we are dealing with high level languages and low level languages so what does the language translator do so these are system software which helps convert high level language into simple machine level code what is high level language whenever we are writing code we are writing in plain english right we are writing okay do this uh, or store this these num these kind of numbers into something or print uh, this sentence for me we are writing in english but our computer does not understand that it understands only binary language it only understands the machine level language so these language translators at different levels are converting those human readable code the english language code that we have written into machine level code that machine can perform and they can do it vice versa also so like machine has provided some output to us now we cannot understand binary language so that binary code received from machine is converted back to human readable code by these language translators so uh, the conversion is usually performed using some programming language or translator or processor so programming language translators help computer programs written in high level programming languages what are high level programming languages 
kind those can be a java c c++ python they are also called source code the code that we have written and that particular code is converted into instructions that can be interpreted by machine so language translator as name suggest human readable code into machine code or machine code into human readable code so these are language translators which are pre installed in your systems or they come installed with your code editors they come installed with your uh, uh, like uh, javascript engines so these are language translators moving ahead utility softwares utility softwares are designed to perform specific task and the most of the time they are running in the background they always run in the background some of the ut utility softwares are related to your security and optimization programs like uh, your antivirus softwares that keeps on scanning your device to check if any malicious software has been installed or not any fake website has been opened or not any virus encountered or not so these keep on running in the background so uh, utility softwares we, what we need to keep in mind is they are always running in the background and they are mostly related to security and optimization uh, optimization uh, programs security programs are like your antivirus softwares like your avast antivirus or your cleanup systems like your system cleanup uh, like you have something like format disks those are your utility softwares these are related with your file compression or uh, dividing your disk into different spaces like if you have uh, uh, say 1 terabyte of your uh, hard disk in your computer and you want to divide it into three different disks that is done with uh, disk defragmentations through utility softwares so they are typically installed as a part of operating system and they have access to hard drives to keep it tidy they keep your hard drives tidy to make sure nothing extra uh, or nothing unwanted is there into your into your computer so these were five uh, major types of your system software operating systems which boot up your computer and have rules for other applications to run device drivers which connect one hardware to other hardware like your computer to printer firmware which tells the connected hardware what and how it needs to perform a particular function language translators uh, these are the translators that uh, convert the human readable language into machine level language and they can do uh, the otherwise as well like machine level code into human readable code so that machine can understand what we have written and we can understand what output machine has given to us by the term machine we mean uh, the computers utility softwares softwares dealing for a specific task that is security and file management security like your antiviruses and file management like your disk cleanups and uh, file compressions like zip folders you create for particular uh, large files those are done under utility softwares they keep your hard drives clean and tidy so this was your system software moving ahead let's see the application software what are application softwares uh, before we jump uh, and yes. uh, there is a question from Mr. Safi, and he's asking which software is exactly interpreter. Let me just pull up the chat. Allow me just one. Okay. So, which software is exactly called interpreter? There's not one particular uh, software uh, I would say for interpreter. Interpreters are basically computer programs that execute your the instructions written by the programming language. So, uh, for instance, like uh, you, uh, if we are writing some programs in JavaScript, then there is a JavaScript engine developed by Google. That engine is called V8. That V8 engine has the capability to understand what we have written and what machine needs to provide the code. So this is a, like a, if we consider this interpreter, compiler and assembler. So interpreter is like it interprets line by line what we have written. Then compiler, it compiles all the code together to form a meaningful statement for the machine and then assembles with the required response. 
So it's not one particular software. These are, uh, the, the, uh, yes, please. Can we call the software which brings back end to front uh, back, right? Yeah, you can call that because front end is something that we are writing to make the web pages look good, right? And now we are sending those requests to web servers. Web servers are sending the, the files, the HTML, JavaScript, and CSS files. Those are then converted to the human readable form. So you can call those softwares which brings the files from back end to the user and make it uh, look uh, or or we can interpret what the server has provided. Yes, you can call those softwares as the language translators. So there is not one particular software. They are pre-embedded into your uh, uh, web servers or some uh, web browser engines as well. So from when we are writing some code, the uh, Google engine, the V8 engine, converts the code into the machine readable and sends it to browser. Browser then, uh, sorry, send it to web server. Web server then converts the code and send it back to V8 engine. And that's how the, uh, the, the applications are running. So you remember we understood that, okay, we are receiving HTML, CSS, JavaScript file and our browser knows how to collect them together and show the result. How browser knows that is with the help of language translator. So we would be understanding language translators way more when we would be learning JavaScript. So th at that point of time, you would understand because JavaScript is just in time compilation language. It's getting... Uh, every line is getting compiled so we would be we would be understanding what just in time compilation is so at that point of time we would have more clarity uh, any other <clears throat> yeah yeah uh, if uh, i'm pausing um, in the chat i'm pausing a, a video uh, if 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 you want to play it it's very amazing in terms of explaining the uh, the interpreters and as well as uh, the translators. It's very, very nice video. It's gonna, it's gonna be only three minutes. Very useful right. now and in the future. If you can play it, uh, let's watch sure. it. Definitely, I'll quickly play this and I'll share the sound as well. When you land in the world of when you land in the world of computers with their strange convoluted machine language it's a bit like landing on another planet whose inhabitants speak an equally strange convoluted alien language getting a mechanic on planet gobbledygook to repair your spaceship would present the same sort of problem that you have when you want to get a computer to do something everything you say has to be translated and you have a choice between two different sorts of translator. One of them is called an interpreter, and the other is called a compiler. Let's suppose that you've previously written out your list of instructions for the repair of your spaceship. And suppose that you choose the interpreter to do the translating. He reads your first instruction, open lid of rocket engine, translates this into gobbledygook, and immediately passes it on to the mechanic who executes the instruction. Then the interpreter reads your second instruction, remove spark plug, translates this into gobbledygook and passes it on to the mechanic who executes it. And so on and so forth. Now notice how the interpreter works. He stays with you all the time and he translates each of your instructions immediately one by one. This is a rather slow process because the mechanic has to wait while each instruction is being translated. But on the other hand, it does give you a chance to correct your mistakes as you go along. If the mechanic removes the wrong spark plug, for instance, you'll see this happen right away and you'll be able to change your instruction accordingly. Compare this with the way the second sort of translator, the compiler, goes about his work. He takes your complete list of instructions and without further ado, translates the whole lot straight into gobbledygook. 
He then hands them back to you and goes away, leaving you all on your own. All this has taken some time, but from now on, things will go very fast. You hand the complete list of gobbledygook to the mechanic, and he executes them all in one go. Bang, bang, bang. There's no waiting about this time. But there's one disadvantage to this, of course. If there was a mistake in your instructions, it's too late now. This analogy comes very close to the way the interpreter and compiler translator programs actually work with computers. An interpreter runs slowly, starts right away, and lets you see how things are going. Whereas a compiler takes extra preparation time before your program can run, but then lets it run very quickly and efficiently. To help you remember the difference between an interpreter and a compiler, look at the words themselves. Inter means between. The interpreter is always between your program and the computer, and it translates line by line. To compile, on the other hand, means to pile together. A compiler piles together your entire program and translates the whole thing all at once. Which one you use on Planet Gobbledygook is entirely up to you. It was a really nice video. I think everything, every answer we got in that video, how interpret is working, how compiler is working. Thank you so much, Dash. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I appreciate it. <clears throat> So shall we move to application software? Uh, any doubts in, in these categories? Any any particular doubt before moving ahead? Just give me a yes or no. If you have any doubt, give me a yes. If no, well, then we, uh, just write no in the chat. Perfect. So let's move ahead. The next category is your application software. Right now we covered system software. So we remember that earlier we created this uh, hierarchy. So if this is your hardware, this is your system software, then this is your application software. Now application part, the apps that we started, they all lie in this application software. So that's why applications of apps are part of your software stack. It's not entire software. So that's where uh, we discussed different types of apps. Now un let's understand different types of application software and what an application software in general is. So application software is everything else. Anything that is not an operating system or a utility program in, is an application. So it could be a word processor. It could be a spreadsheet like Excel. It could be a web browser. It could be any graphics software. All are examples of application software. And they can do many specific tasks. You can remove and add an application on your computer using operating system. You can delete an application. You can add an application. And the platform over which you're adding or removing is a system software, which is your operating system. So application software is like word processors, a regularly direct operating system to load and save files from and to your hardware. When you're working on a file, initially it is saved on your RAM. So when you're working, initially it goes to RAM. And now if by chance your computer crashes or your system goes down, then these files are not yet saved. In order to save them, you have to specifically give the command and then these are written to hard drives. So if you have not saved any file, the data is stored in RAM and that is volatile. This data gets lost when, when uh, the RAM loses power. If, the, if your computer shuts down, the RAM loses power, any data on RAM gets lost. So that's why everyone says, keep saving on your, keep saving on your files because then those files are written on your hard drive and the files are being created by application software. So there are many types of application software. Here I have discussed some major types. First is your word processor. So word processor, we all know we have uses, used it. So it's a program that creates text-based documents. So it's a text-based documents. So these, these applications have many features that allow us to write, edit, format documents. 
basic features of uh, word processing softwares can include ability to format text, bold, underline, or uh, create tables, headers, footers that we've been doing using MS Word. So many of these programs also have options somewhat like they can they can help you correct your spellings. They can help you correct your grammar uh, mistakes. So word processing based on text and all the abilities are associated with text based uh, features. Second comes your database software. As the name suggests, this type of application software allows users to create and manage database. So now what is a database? It's a place where we can store data, we can manipulate data, we can access data. So that helps to organize the data in a, in a structured way. The user can request, analyze, change or access data. Major databases that we can use is MySQL softwares that you can install. Usually these are installed when you're working on some backend uh, projects, MySQL or MongoDB. MongoDB is a NoSQL so software that you can install. So database software is your access file managers on your phones or on your devices where you can uh, check the files that have been deleted. You can restore them. You can change uh, the order of files and so on. You can organize data. So database software deals with organizing data, accessing data, and making it easier for user to manage the files and other stuff stored in its, uh, I would say, machine. Second, uh, the third comes your multimedia software. So multimedia software that allows or that allows user to modify multimedia uh, aspects of your uh, work. Uh, for instance, it could be your images, it could be your audio, video, any software that lets you combine these formats to create interactive content. So you can use multimedia applications to play a file, to record a file, to record audio or edit uh, video files. They, these days, multimedia files, multimedia softwares have equalizer options. They can help you improve the sound quality by applying effects, by uh, applying noise reduction. So typically, multimedia softwares allow users to convert formats of files to, uh, to read those files, which are related to audio, video, and images. And they can also make them compatible. You can change the format of file. Earlier, it was in one format, like JPG format, and you want to convert it to your PNG format. Multimedia softwares can help you do that. Uh, fourth comes your graphic software. So graphic software are used to perform graphic related tasks. They are primarily used like for designing logos, building flow charts, designing illustrations easily. So this can have your PowerPoints, uh, MS Paint, your Corel Draw, Photoshop, through which you can make changes in illustrations, make flow charts, make uh, logos. So these are graphic softwares. Last one that we have discussed is your web browser. We've all started web browser in detail. It's an application software which can be used to access or to search information on the internet. You can use various web browsers to find data online. And you can, uh, web browsers these days have many features, like you can see your browsing history, you can bookmark your web pages, you can install extensions also to customize the browser. So these are the major application softwares and we have been using them daily. The major thing that we need to remember is they are, they are running over system software. So if this is your application software, this is your system software, and this is your hardware. So we just need to remember this order. System software is in between application and hardware. And application software need a platform to interact with hardware. And that platform is provided by system software. And mostly that platform is your operating system. So I've, uh, I have a beautiful image that shows the interaction between user, your, your application software, system software, and hardware. So simple, these are your application softwares. If a user wants to access any application software, for instance, Excel, he needs to get in touch with the operating system first, and then operating system would get in touch with the respective hardware. So these are hardware. So if uh, you want to access Netflix, you need audio and video, both content, then your uh, operating system, any operating system would get in touch with the respective, uh, your audio, uh, uh, hardware devices, video hardware devices, and so on. 
So user interacts with application software, application software interacts with operating systems and operating system in turn interacts with your hardware. So these were major types of uh, application software, system software. So we have discussed the types of software, any doubts and types of software. Then uh, after that, after this, we would move to development life cycles. So any doubts so far? Okay, so let's move ahead. Let's see software development life cycle. So what is a software development life cycle? Why software development life cycle was needed? So we need to understand, we would be answering uh, three questions over here. I'll just move to that slide. So what is software or application development life cycle? So we would be answering three major questions over here. First, what is your software development life cycle? So I would define software development life cycle as a structured process, which defines and outlines a detailed plan with stages or phases. And each stage or each phase has its own process and deliverables. So what is, it is a structured process, defined process, which has different stages. And each stage, each stage or each phase has its own process. And we need to follow that process in order to have a good software. Second question comes, why software development lifecycle is needed? So major points that I've listed down are, first, software development lifecycle enables the production of high quality, low cost software in shortest possible production time. The major goal of software development lifecycle is to produce superior software that meets and exceeds all the customer expectations and demands. Our major thing is to make sure whatever our customer has requested, those things have been provided. And when we are following the software development lifecycle uh, stages effectively, then it increases the development speed, it minimizes the project risk and uh, decreases the cost associated with the, the methods of production. So very important, what software development life cycle? A structured process with multiple stages. We would be studying these stages and why? First, high quality software, low cost and shortest possible time should meet the customer's expectations. And well, while following these stages, it increases speed, minimizes project risk and the cost of uh, the entire uh, development process. Now comes how many stages are there? So in total, there are six stages. So we would be studying them very briefly. So what these stages are, analysis, design, development, testing, deployment, and maintenance, we would be seeing them with a bunch of examples. So over here, right now, uh, what I have mentioned over here is the list of people that are involved in those stages. So in your analysis stage, the product owner, the, uh, the person who has that idea, the idea generator, the project manager, business analyst, your chief technical officers, those are a part of the analysis team. Then comes your design team. Design team, you have UX, UI designers, graphic designers, system architects. Third comes your development, front-end, back-end developers. So our job is lying over here but we are deeply connected with each of the stage. So we would be seeing there. Then testing comes, your quality assurance engineers, DevOps engineers, testers are there, like highly skilled people in testing. So like you would be highly skilled in coding the application and they would be skilled in writing tests for your application to check if your application meets certain parameters or not. Then deployment team, you have database administrators who would be dealing with the databases, DevOps, and then maintenance, you have uh, users. Users provide the effective feedback. Okay, we, we are finding these things uh, need some uh, upgradation. The development team would listen to those feedback and implement them. Testers are there, support managers. So these are the list of people who are in that team. And they would be performing defined tasks under each of these stage. So let's move on to our first stage. Let's see what analysis phase is. So let's move on to analysis phase. So first is analysis phase. 
it is also known as your discovery phase or idea generation phase because this is the first phase of your application so what does it imply it implies it conducting research ample amount of research doing preparation work before the beginning of actual development process right now no development process has happened but the entire analysis phase revolves around doing research and preparation work the agenda behind it is to collect as much data as possible in order to plan the entire digital project so if we just go to the definition part so it just remember analysis phase is the research phase preparation work before actual coding has happened the main idea behind it is to gather as much information and to plan the entire project so what is the main role of analysis phase the main role is to understand i would say ins and outs of the product and to find answers to certain questions so i've listed few questions which must be answered when you are going through an analysis phase what are those questions so the first question is what is the final goal of your digital pro product for instance you got an idea of building an a, a, a type of game then what what is the final goal of your game how it would look how it should uh, get addressed by the customers what all features it would include then what are the current challenges in specific market in the game industry what challenges other people are facing next question can come what obstacles can come while you're creating your product do you have enough skilled labor do you have enough skilled uh, uh, tech stack uh, available with you like are you ahead of the tech stack or do you have the required technology or not so how your product is different from other competitors if you're building some uh, let's say mine sweep game and there are other games as well how are how are, how is your product different what is your target audience which platforms your game would be compatible would it be for ios devices would be would it be for android devices so categorizing that what exactly technology you would be using like would you be using python would you be using javascript would you be using java so de describing on the basis of tech stack and what would be the estimated cost and duration of your product and what time you are thinking to finish your product all these questions need to be answered in analysis phase to get answers to these questions every project follows a set tem template there is a fixed template of your analysis phase of your discovery phase this template is divided into three major domains so what are those three major domains the three major domains are your business your market and your user all the question lies in one of the categories so what is the final product so it would deal with the business one so what is your target audience it might deal with the market so uh, what is how uh, your audience is feeling after how your audience would feel after getting the product it would go under the user category so all the questions all the questions under analysis phase get divided into these three major domains business market and user and accordingly different teams are assigned to each particular uh, domain and they keep on doing research to find the correct answers so this was your first uh, uh, i would say stage the second stage which is very important comes your design stage so what is design stage so design stage is like giving your digital product its unique look and feel so designers work to make your app stand out and they do so in three defined steps so let's see what uh, your design phase is so first design phase is just like giving some look and feel to your idea that how it would look so there are three defined steps the first step is your sketching so what is sketching so first step sketching at this stage designers prepare the concept this is concept building stage designers are preparing the concept of your app so when it comes to visual details like you want to explain something to someone it is much much easier to sketch that with a pen or pencil than to explain an idea with your hands and fingers you cannot explain them okay this should be there this should be there if you have drawn something then it would help really so there are certain bullet points that i've written regarding the sketching phase i would go through them very quickly so let's see them so 
under sketching we usually refer to hand sketching so designers are preparing the concept of concept of the app so the hand sketching part translates your ideas into paper a clear sketch unites the team i would say when everything is on paper almost everyone in the company is able to imagine the app correctly and understand what they are trying to build it is not necessary to have perfect shapes you need not have perfect shapes or a beautiful sketch just an idea so this phase why this phase is given so much importance because here it costs you nothing you can make a, a, a required adjustments in comparison to making changes in next phases so if you are making some adjustments over here it is not harming you anyway later on when you have de developed a certain level of product and you want to make changes it becomes very difficult and it costs a lot to big companies as well let's see few examples how sketching is done so let me uh, show you an image so this is a simple image of uh, let's say meditation application that helps you meditate so they have designed the first page this is all done with pencil and paper so how it would if you click this one begin how it would look length of meditation they have decided okay this kind of numbers we would display this should be the web this should be the page where you can control the volume and background sounds different screens you can see every screen has been created with pen and pencil or or with simple paper so like omid is asking is sketching same as prototype uh, no omid prototype is the third phase of your design third stay a uh, third uh, i would say part of your design phase first is your sketching th uh, second is your wireframe and third is prototype prototype in in prototype we actually provide the functionality to our application we make it look like a real app we can we put colors we put content actual content in sketching we just do it with pen and paper in prototype we actually give some functionality color content so we would be studying prototype just uh, after two slides so after uh, sketching i would be doing via framing and then prototype so it's very different you'll see the difference clear difference so we understand sketching right sketching pen paper pencil simple hand sketching just giving i would say an your idea some image giving an image to your idea so this is one mobile app second could be your web page how does a web page look like so it's like uh, your food planner web page it's just uh, drawn with pen paper pencil they have shown okay this should be the username should be displayed over here this should be the sign out button how image should be there what information should be there how a particular food item what all they can contain different categories so an idea has been given some visual representation using pen and paper that is called sketching so this was your sketching phase now comes your wireframing what is wireframing wireframing is very important so wireframing details the overall structure your page will take there are some major points that you need to remember wireframing it tells uh, like it's uh i would if i have to keep it in simple form i would say it tells how you want your data to be shown on pages and how your pages would navigate to other web pages of your application so if i write it in simple form how your data should be displayed should be shown and second part the navigation flow from one page to other navigation flow so you'll see uh, very quickly you'll see an image and it would depict so i've written some uh, major points for wireframing as well i'll quickly clear my screen but remember this how your data should be shown and navigation flow very important so let's go through these so details the overall structure of pages we'll quickly see that in an image then it tells the idea how the functionality should be there right now we have not added any color or content the adding color and content goes to your prototyping so a good wireframe represents the overall structure of your web page and the flow of navigation on these web pages so imagine you're designing a mobile app you would need to create a wireframe for each screen suppose you have multiple screens so you have multiple web pages of your application 
then you need to create wireframe for each page and it tells the hierarchy of pages as well which page would come after the first one which page would come after the second one how should space be allocated on different pages what functionalities should be given so you actually tell the informational hierarchy of web pages as well and based on the information detail being provided on a wireframe these are categorized into i would say three types first is your low fidelity simple pen paper second is your medium fidelity you've added some uh, visual representation through some software and third is your high fidelity in which you have created the wireframe in a very beautiful app looking way so let's see how a different a particular wireframe looks it would be easier for us to imagine suppose this is your uh, money bank app you can put in your uh, savings you can check who has spent how much amount at what point of time where so so this is your simple mobile screen which has multiple apps this is your money bank app when you click on this it would wireframe is telling us what screen should be opened what should be there and now if you click on sign in button what page should open if you click on search button what should open if you are clicking on these two buttons what is happening it is telling us to like increase or decrease values so wireframing is telling you the navigation flow when you click something it is telling you where your data should be placed how it should look on each screen sketching was a very rough uh, visual representation wireframing is giving it a, a flow from one screen to the other now let's see the, a wireframe when you're designing an app for your mobile as well as for desktop so uh, suppose your app has three pages home page and then home page has the contact page about page and features page so this is the wireframe for your mobile version it shows okay my phone call should be over here my mobile menu should be over here responsive responsive basically means adjusting to different resolutions so you, you can see amazon website on your phone you can see amazon website on your desktop and both gets adjusted as per the resolution of your device that is your responsiveness so it, the responsive word is simply showing that each section is made responsive for mobile version as well now what i am trying to show over here is suppose my home page has a set of buttons and if i click on this button it would open the features page now how my feature page would would look my feature page has this button if i click on this button my contact page would come so now i'm i'm able to see how different pages would be opened by clicking which part of my web app or which part of my web page and how different sections would look like this is the about us section how would it look feature 1 feature 2 feature 3 and what information would it hold information of more info company image should be over here site map should be over here business contact info should be over here so we are just telling on pen and paper right now how we navigate through different pages of our web app and that navigation flow is called wireframing you're connecting wires from one page to the other not actual wires but some digital connections you're trying to show through your pen and paper so that is wireframing now comes the prototyping prototyping is the last stage of design so what is prototype if i have to de define prototype prototype is like a clickable model something which you can interact with it's a clickable model which looks exactly like your app and uh, it has same functionality same color same content but the back end part is not still implemented you've just designed the front end part which through which you can show how particular screens would look like so if i just move on to the prototyping so it's the last part of your design clickable model looks like real app few screens are prepared very important we are not we have not prepared the entire screens these prototypes are provided to the bunch of users for feedback or to the investors of our application so that can, they can check if the prototype is good the entire application would look like the prototype Uh, that has been designed if they need some changes they would give the feedback and we would make those changes in the prototyping 
main thing that we need to understand right now, we have not done any actual coding. This is happening at the design phase. The designers are doing, the UX designers are doing, or there are beautiful softwares like Envision software through which you can make the sketching and the uh, wireframes and prototypes very easily. So what a prototype does, it shows the user flow. It helps understand the planned functionality of the potential mobile app. What would, the, what would be the functionality of a particular web page? So for instance, you have an iOS app prototype which shows an application, how it would look on the screen, respective screen resolution of your iPhone. So let me show you a diff, uh, uh, an image of prototype. So suppose this is your uh, calendar application or something we can call to do application in which you can mark what task needs to be done on a particular day. So they have shown how a web page would look. They have added the color. They have shown the account uh, holders information, particular uh, monthly section and different categories in which you can mark your dates. So they have created few screens three screens out of 10 screens to show how it would look if the investors or if the decided bunch of users pass this prototype, then the process moves ahead towards development phase, the phase where actual coding happens. So this is prototype. So what's the difference between sketching and prototype? Sketching has no color, no content, just a vague idea how it would look. Prototype has actual colors, actual content, and few screens are prepared that needs to be passed by the potential investor or by the users. And wireframing is uh, providing navigation flow between different screens. So if we have to show wireframing over here, suppose this is January, and if I uh, remove this one, if a user clicks over here, then this particular web page would move over here. And if a user clicks on a particular date, then user gets this page to mark it either as present, absent, bunk, leave, and so on. So this is wireframing, providing the navigation flow to a particular respective button or uh, part of your uh, application to show how we would be moving from one page to the other. So are we clear with sketching, uh, wireframing, and prototype? Any doubts on this one before moving ahead? Uh, just see, uh, can you see uh, sketch, lo-fi, hi-fi? So this lo-fi and hi-fi are low fidelity and high fidelity. So this represents the wireframing details. So in this sketch, just see a simple pen paper sketch, nothing more. This low fidelity has some more details in it. This thing is missing. High fidelity has more details in it. So this is how wireframing is divided further into the amount of details a particular wireframe is having a particular uh, your uh, the application wireframe or web page wireframe is having so this is low fidelity high fidelity medium fidelity so three types of wireframing based on the amount of details so just a nice example to see the difference between sketch and your wireframing so let's move ahead to next phase, which is very important. And we all have been waiting for that. That is development phase. This is where we jump in. Before that, I have an image which shows how a sketch turns into a prototype, a simple image, a simple sketch, then a wireframe with certain details, then a mockup screen, which have some more details. And finally, a prototype, which actually looks like an application on your mobile device. So the details are in have been added at every stage of your design phase. So just keep in this mind that these are different uh, phases of a design stage and how things are turning into the application that we look in our, uh, in our devices. So let's move ahead to the development phase. Now the design is ready, but it's still a lot of work to turn into a fully functional product model. This is where we programmers step into the game and code all the necessary features. Now, development process can be divided into two parts. What are those two parts? Your client side and server side. We have spent, I would say, quite a good time on understanding what a client side is and what a server side is. Now, client side is also called your front end. This is user side. 
and this is the face of program with which users interact. The task of a front end developer is to guarantee a flawless user friendly experience. So what does client side developers would mean front end developers would would mean they would be dealing with these technologies HTML CSS JavaScript and then one of the frameworks. These are different frameworks of JavaScript and the one that we would be dealing is react bootstrap is your it's connected with your CSS how to make uh, CSS easier to write and your client side is connected with the server through Internet. We have read that. There are different web servers like Apache web servers. It's there. Then backend languages. The one we would be dealing is Node.js and various databases. That is MongoDB that we would be covering. Now, backend part is the functional part that guarantees the functioning of whole system. So backend refers to the server side application. It is responsible for all the operations like calculations and finally making an app reliable. I would say front end is the part that shows how an app would look and we would be covering them in detail today. This session would be a last session regarding the development phase and other theoretical concepts from tomorrow. We would be uh, downloading and uh, setting up our developer uh, development environment with the help of code editors and we would be starting with these technologies. We would see how they are working, what they actual mean, how they make a web page look good. So this is your development phase. At this stage, the programmers create their first version of MVP. This is very important in your uh, field. You would hear this term very often that we have created the first version of MVP. What is MVP? Minimum valuable product. The first product which seems valuable and has all the functionality for regarding the user side and the server side is called your minimum valuable product. This minimum valuable valuable product, your MVP then goes through the next phase. The next phase is the testing phase. It involves different uh, scenarios like quality assurance, uh, quality control and testing. So let's move on to that phase. So these technologies we would be covering in detail once we are done with today's session from tomorrow. And uh, then we would understand how they're actually working. What role HTML play, what role CSS play, what role JavaScript play and similarly for backend part. Now our design, we have uh, developed the product. Our MVP is ready, minimum valuable product, and that would be sent to the testing team. So let's see, this is quality assurance phase. It is very important phase. It is testing phase. Now testing team starts uh, putting your application through different kind of tests. These could be your unit tests, integration tests, UI tests and so on. Why is this done? This is done to verify whether your software works and gives the result as per the requirements and where were these requirements listed? These requirements were listed in analysis phase. Remember everything is getting connected. Analysis phase gave us a set of requirements. And those requirements are tested through these tests and requirements we have fulfilled by doing the front end and back end coding of our application. Now it's time to test them. Now the development team makes a test plan. This test plan includes various tests. Those are listed over here. If there is any defect or if there is any bug that is detected in your application, it is uh, it means your application is not working as expected. The testing team gives those details to the front end team to the back end team respective team and those teams read those bugs and understand where it is occurring. And if they feel it necessary, then those bugs are removed. Now, what do I mean by necessary? Why every bug is not removed? Because if, if we want to make sure an application is good, then proper testing should cover 90% of the stated risks. If you have made the list of potential risk and your application is covering 90% of the potential risks, your application is good to be launched. And to optimize this testing process, we keep on doing automated testings or some manual tests as well. 
why why are we doing it why are we spending so much time on testing major reason is it is always easier to fix bugs fix your uh, defects before releasing the application rather than keep coming back to the step over and over again after you have published the application to the store and uh, and that would may result to collection of negative user reviews no one wants to have negative reviews on the app stores for their application so that's why teams spend so much time over here they keep on testing their application rigorously to make sure before releasing the application more than 90% of your application is uh, safe to be launched does not have any potential risks and if there are some minor risks those are covered in the maintenance phase the last phase next comes your release phase release phase is very simple your application is ready pass the tests now your application is uh, ready to be launched on the app store is ready to be delivered to the respective client and those clients can further uh, give that application to the respected end users so the next part is your maintenance phase the 10% defects that i uh, that were left those are covered in your maintenance phase what is maintenance phase it's continuous bugs fixing and if the technology is getting advanced then updating features into your application if users have provided some review then adding those features after uh, studying those reviews effectively so this is your uh, quality assurance phase development phase maintenance phase so this covers your software development cycle